What's going on, everybody? Happy Monday. It's April Fool's Day. My Wi-Fi is playing games. My Wi-Fi is tripping right now. So I apologize if my Wi-Fi is bad today. Uh, my internet provider is playing an April Fool's joke on me. Croc, man, how you doing today, brother? I'm doing good, man. Feeling good. Feeling blessed. Good workout this morning. Ready to go. See, I was going to ask you about that, man. So for me, it turned out to be 75 soft. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Are you still with it? I fell off Thursday. I didn't get, I got one workout in, did not get the second workout in, and did not finish a gallon of water. So I got to start over. I, I'm probably going to get back to it this week, next week, something yeah. like that. So, you know. Yeah, I fell off. I a little structure in my life on the in the in the workout sense of things and and mentally, you know. I I, I fell off after like six days, bro. I ain't gonna lie, cause it's that second workout and the gallon that get me. Like I can do one per day, but and I can do it. I just gotta man up and do it, you know. But I'm still working out, still trying to eat healthy. So overall, I'm I'm still proud of myself. Man, let me know in the chat. Is the Wi-Fi just bad right now? Because it looks like it's bad based on my. Now you good? You good. good? Yeah. All right, cool, man. Well, Croc and I got a lot to talk about real quick, though. Uh, Dave Barkley, there they are. What's up, guys? Still killing. I appreciate you, Dave. Man, hit me up. I know we got to talk about some real estate stuff, so hit me up, man. Be glad to uh, go over all that with you if I can. Real quick, if you guys would be so kind, hit that like button and subscribe to both channels: Croc's channel, my channel. Uh, like the video that helps with the algorithm also i relaunched my podcast trying to get like uh croc croc was kind enough to give me some advice backstage uh about how to post my my stuff to podcast form so i did that links in the details in the description on how you can do that and then this is important man croc's in the final four he was the champion last year he's in the final four going head to head with larry kruger right now uh, on the on the other side is uh, Matt Mayoko and Brad Graham. You predicted Brad Graham was going to win it all. Um, but first things first, make sure you go vote for Croc head-to-head versus Larry Kruger, man. How you feeling about your, your chances right now? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it's always interesting w- with this, you know, with the, with the 49ers content and, and the landscape of things. I think there are so many guys that do such great work, man. So just to be – Kind of mentioned, obviously, you know, I won it last year, and I think I probably had the same conversation around it. I feel like there's a lot of people that do more than me. You know, I do Locked On 49ers every day, and we reach a, a, a really big audience. I love doing Locked On 49ers. But there are some others, like Brad, you know, like Larry Kruger, that, um, you know, every day, man, every day, they, they got several shows. They got great guests. They, You know, they're doing a, a whole lot. Brad, I know with his what he does with uh, the SF 49ers, and uh, how much time and effort he puts into that. He travels. He's going to, you know, the draft. He's going to the, you know, pro days. And and he's going to the the uh, uh, combine, man. He just does so much for the 49ers community. So I have a lot of respect for all those guys, man, that's up there. And uh, it's always an honor to, to just know that, you know, people rock with you. You know what I'm saying? And when you see me in the final four of, of it or winning it last year, for me, it was just, Man, people rock with me. So I, I rock with y'all, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's dope. Make sure you vote for my guy, Croc. Even though Larry and I are cool again, we're cool, so it's all good. But Croc's my guy. We do a show every Monday. Uh, so make sure you uh, go vote for Croc. Larry's killing real quick. I, I like Larry's format, man. Um, you know, obviously he has a big radio background. I mean, I listen to, I listen to Larry Kruger for years on, on the radio. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm really yeah. – KBR, 957 The Game, like I really listen to those – uh, shows, especially, uh, you know, I've worked various jobs and a lot of jobs, you know, before podcasts were really big, man, I pop an air, air buddy in and I just be listening to the radio. So I've been listening to Larry Kruger and I think he brings that radio, uh, experience to his YouTube channel, man. He does an amazing job. Yeah, man. It was a trip when I first started, uh, doing shows, I, you know, did a couple shows with Larry. I, it was kind of weird because like you said, man, I think I've been listening to him since I was 20 years old or something like that you know so uh it's kind of wild how everything comes full circle uh real quick i'm gonna try, i'm trying to get to 10k man i got about 1400 to go i'm trying to get there before the season starts 20k after the season i got big goals i feel like i'm gonna hit them but make sure if you guys would be so kind if you're not subscribed yet please do so uh it's much appreciated um all right man before we dive in uh, to the whole show i do got to pay the bills one thing i'm doing is i'm gonna minimize the amount of commercials and things I plug and I'm going to plug what's most important to me, which is 
my real estate and mortgage business. Today's show, we're going to talk about Eric Armstead, Brandon Ayuk, Demo, Charvarius Ward, and some Brock Purdy things, as well as around one prediction. But before we do that, let me pay these bills. Give us 30 seconds. We'll be right back with the show. What's going on, 49er fans? Thank you so much for watching the show and subscribing to the channel. Hopefully you know already, but just in case you don't, the main way I provide for my family and the business I've been running since 2009 is Hensley Real Estate and Mortgage. If you live in California and you're financing, refinancing, buying, or selling a home, I would love to assist you and your family. Visit my website, ryanghensley.com, or schedule an appointment with me. The details are in the description on how you can do all of that. Let's make this happen for you and your family. Now back to the show. Yeah, man, I learned from Croc and uh, Peacock. Plug plug the sponsor at the beginning, and then you don't have to worry about it. Dive into the show after that. That's from listening to Locked On 49ers. Make sure you subscribe to that too, man. Hey, hey, real quick, Peacock, man, you guys, you guys got to check out my dog Peacock. That's my brother right there. He he got a YouTube channel. It's uh, Overtime with BP. Uh, go to my Twitter page. You'll see it's one of my recent tweets out. Uh, subscribe to his YouTube channel. It's gonna be uh, all things. Uh, sports Bay Area, obviously a lot of 49ers and uh, sprinkle of some, you know, talking about some cocktails. Peacock used to be a bartender, so he he loves his cocktails and all that. So great conversation. Make sure y'all subscribe to my dog channel. Yes, sir. Peacock is great, man. I like Peacock a lot, man. I enjoy listening to your guys's Locked On 49ers. Um, I, I listen to that show myself, man. Uh, real quick, it is April Fool's Day, man. I pulled a fast one on a few of you. I was trying to, like, in the show description, I said major announcement. I was going to try to pull this off, too, live, like, with you. But I can't do it with a straight face, man. But I tweeted this. <laughs> I made this and tweeted it out this morning, and hella people got got full with it. Some people uh, are mad. Why is everyone so mad, man? It's April Fool's Day, man. Can't we just have a little fun? I'm corny like that, bro. Like, I like dad jokes. This morning, I convinced my daughter that her car was stolen. Like, I texted her. I'm like, hey, where's your car at? And she's like, what you mean? It's out front. I'm like, no, it's not. I already had moved it around the corner. She was ready. She was ready to call the police. I'm like, nah, I'm just kidding. It's around the corner. April Fool's. I like I like doing that stuff, man. Maybe it's the dad in me. Uh, but if I got you guys with this tweet this morning, I don't apologize, man. It's April Fool's Day. So I got that. I got to get my wife with, with, with something, man. I haven't. I, I'm usually not. It's weird because I'm really you guys, you know, give me a lot talking about a lot of sports stuff. But I'm actually like really goofy in person, yeah. and uh, but I never play like those kind of pranks. I scare my wife a lot, but I need to I need to do an April Fool's joke on her. Yeah, man, I'm goofy as shit, bro. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm I'm uh, me and my wife crazy. I mean, that's one of the best things I like. Me and my wife, we like to joke around a lot, man. So yeah, make sure you get the wife. She she's a little crazy though, so I got to be careful how I prank my wife. <laughs> she might mess around and hit me or something. Uh. Yeah, real quick, Black Suburban, man. I don't know if you're playing an April Fool's joke on us. He says, I got jerseys for you, too. I'm not joking, dead serious. Uh, I don't sell them. I collect them and give them away. Well, I'll gladly take it, brother. Hit us up, man. Hit me on the – both Croc and I, I think your DMs are open on Twitter, right? I think so. I ain't never yeah. closed them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, mine too, man. So, yeah, hit us up. Thanks, Black Suburban, man. We, we appreciate it, man. Um, all right, cool, brother. So, we're going to dive into Brock Purdy because I think – you know, I was thinking about him a lot this past weekend, but we're going to lead up to that. Oh, oh I we start with Eric Armstead. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about because I we haven't talked about that yet. I haven't had a show since this news. And I'm curious, you know, you're a former NFL player. Talk to me about uh, Eric Armstead feeling disrespected, man. You know, I, I think a big part of what, what I'm reading a lot on social media is people that truly don't understand just the business side of things. And people say it like, oh, it's a business and this and that, but like, I don't think people truly understand. So I, I'll start with kind of my situation in the NFL, what I saw. Then we'll get to Eric Armstead. All right. But y'all got to remember, man, me getting to the NFL, I, I wasn't like this this guy that balled out in Pop Warner. You know what I'm saying? I only played one year. Got to high school. Um, I was I, I was a late bloomer. So I was like 5'4 as a freshman and five, six as a sophomore. It wasn't until like my junior and senior year I grew. And then I had academic issues, ineligible for five games my junior year, ineligible for five games my senior year, had to go the junior college route, uh, ended up being ineligible again, had to drop out, had a son. It's just a crazy path, right? Um, was out of school for several years, for three years, I think it was. 
uh, before actually going back to junior college. Then I earned a scholarship. Then things started kind of bubbling. Well, I came from a Division II school, and uh, I went the arena route right out of college. And then finally, I got an NFL opportunity. Now, all this time, you, you got to understand, I was a big football fan but before anything else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I, I love football. The, the way that I'm on here talking football uh, with, with everybody and how passionate I am, like, I look at myself just like everybody else. Like, I am a fan of the sport, first and foremost. And I had this opportunity almost like, you know, some people be like, man, I just, I would love to be a fly on the wall. In the, in the locker room or in the meetings. Well, I was that fly on the wall, even though I was one of the players. And I got to just see how people interact, how they move, how they talk. And while I grew up kind of putting guys on the pedestal, Antonio Camardi, Darrell Rivas, guys I eventually got to share a locker room with, I quickly realized as soon as we stepped on the field, these dudes, they just like me. Like, they're just like me. Like, they're, they're not – now, Cromartie was a freak. But – and you know, Reeves, Reeves, but for most a majority, like 90% of the roster, it's a lot of guys that's like me, like we're all good, like I'm good, you guys are good, like we're all good. And then when you get into the locker room, I think people expect the locker room to be this place where like egos and all this, that, and the other. Everybody was hella cool, they are just like everybody else in the locker room in the NFL locker room. The only difference between most of us regular people. And them is more M's in, or not even more M's. They got actual M's in their bank account. Like they got more money. But as far as their interaction with people, um, the way they go about their life, it's fairly regular. Like it's very regular. And the interactions with them, they are normal, normal people. So fast forward to this Eric Armstead thing. When he came out and said he felt disrespected, by the amount that they give them. It is no different than any job that you guys have. If you've had a job for a long time and, and you've given them everything you've gotten and you guys have had ups and you've had downs and you've had a certain level of production, the, the way that you do it, right? It might be something that is more uh, valued behind the scenes or whatever. But at the end of the day, he played, he did what he did and he was a good piece to, to the 49ers uh, puzzle for, for years. And ultimately, your value is what someone is willing to pay you, whatever that is, whether you're a podcaster, you know, and, you know, I started to realize my value, what it was right away and um, early on. And I was making, you know, $600 a week or whatever on uh, on the, uh, uh, yeah, I can't even think of that network with Kevin Jones. Anyways, that gave me my start with all this, but uh, yeah. you know, it was striking gold and all that. But, and then Peacock came, and Peacock valued me a certain way. Hit the DMs, head crock. Let's talk numbers. This is what I could do. And he showed me the value. The other network I was on wasn't willing to match that or anything, right? And it wasn't any hard feelings or disrespect. It was just, we can't really do that right now with where we're at. But, you know, hey, man, wish the best for you moving forward with Peacock. And, the, and Peacock and I, it's been really good, <laughs> like bigger than I've ever expected, especially financially. <laughs> But it's just the value, and, and everybody has their value. And whatever value Armstead had to the 49ers, maybe it ran out. But he felt disrespected by what they offered him because he valued himself more than what he was offered. Felt like that wasn't something I'm willing to take on. And he says, you know what? I'm going to go out in the open market, and we're going to see if other people value you, this, value me the same way I value me. And lo and behold, Jacksonville Jaguars said, hey, Armstead, we value you much more than where the 49ers value you today. And we're going to give you this amount of money. So he made his value. They respected that and they gave him that. And I feel like when I'm watching fans, they expect people to turn down millions, to turn down all this money for the betterment of the 49ers. Heck no. What? I've given you guys a lot of good years. I have been here with the 49ers through ups, through downs through Chip Kelly years and all kinds of other stuff. I I have been to Super Bowls, multiple Super Bowls, championship games. To say, well, he just just chasing money, blah, blah, blah. Like, bro, I done gave y'all everything. Injuries, played through injuries, missed games because injuries, broken wrists, whatever it is. And now this is a better situation for me 
moving forward. So I really yeah. want to kind of address that because people aren't viewing him as a person. You know, it's all, oh, if you feel he's made $80 million, if you don't think that's enough to be able to live on that he did wrong, with, why are we counting this man's pockets? Right. You know, at the end of the day, I don't know what his financial situations are, but I do know it is a better situation there than what he had in 49ers and they valued him as such. So uh, yeah. I just see that floating around the social media a lot and people are taking out the human element to these, to, to these conversations. Eric yeah. Armstead is a normal person. Just got more money and he's bigger than everybody else. Yeah, man. Yeah. You said a lot there. So First thing, my career trajectory was a little different. I was a baller as a kid, man. I was a hey, Pop Warner boy. I was good. <laughs> then I got to high school and uh, it, it didn't work out like I was expected. I think I peaked at like 12 years old or something. I don't know. But I was, I was like an all-star baseball player, soccer player. I was good at football, like everything. So our trajectory was opposite. But yeah, the first coming to reality. Well, I was good. Me, I was good athlete and stuff when I was younger, but we didn't have no money to be playing, you know, mm. all these sports and all these things. So every once in a while yeah. I do like a little city lead thing, but it wasn't, you know what I'm saying? So that's, you know, yeah. that was kind of my path, like kind of deterred things a little bit. Yeah. I, like you, man, my grades was tore up in high school. So even if I was good, which I wasn't, because I, I, I'm the kind of guy that I could play sports but I'm not ultra athletic. Like my boys, they got that from their mom. Right. Like, um, but my grades was always, uh, jacked. I, I never really, uh, focused on that, but yeah, the, the coming of reality moment for me when it comes to professional athletes, and this is, you know, like the negative side of it, but you know, I always, I idolized these professional, uh, athletes and, you know, I started writing for Bleacher Report in like 2009, and I got to interview a lot of the 49ers. I in, I interviewed Anthony Davis, the right tackle for the 49ers. And dude was such a dick to me, bro. Like, big time. Like, he went off on me on Twitter, like, for nothing. For nothing. And it was at that point, I'm like, man, these are just regular people. Some good, some bad. They're just people, right? It's not – you don't necessarily – you shouldn't idolize people because of their athletic ability. You should idolize them because of who they are as people. Um, but I just wanted to speak on that because you're talking about how they're regular people. Now, when we're talking about Eric Armstead, I have, so I have multiple feelings on this one. Like first and foremost, I thought the contract that the 49ers had him down for was horrible. So I understand them trying to lower it, but 6 million did seem disrespectful to me for what he does as well. Like I almost be like, if I'm the Niners, I, I would be like, here's what we can pay or. If you're gonna have, offer six million, just be like Eric. We can't afford you, bro. Like you, you need to test the free agent Marcus. It, was offering six million disrespectful to you? I think there's a scenario where they offered him something that they knew he wouldn't take, so that he would just part ways. Yeah, because why, why else would like you? You get you're offering him more than you gave Gross Models, and I don't think Gross Models has done as much as Armstead in the NFL, at least not this early in his career. So That's what they I'm might saying. have just like, wanted him gone and just like, all right, we're gonna offer him six million. If he takes it, great. If he doesn't, then you know, whatever is cool. We we didn't really, you yeah. know, we didn't see him as a big piece to the future, anyways. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what makes me feel like it's disrespectful almost because you know damn well he's worth way more than that. So, so two things like I understand why the 49ers wanted to, you know, move on from Eric Armstead at that price point. I also understand why Eric Armstead was like, are you nuts? Like, you, this is disrespectful. I'm going to go out there and make four times this much. And he did with, with Jacksonville. So I understand both sides. Uh, and I feel like that $6 million is slightly disrespectful. They should have probably just said, hey, bro, we can't afford you. So you, it's probably best for you to go out on the free agent market. Then to offer him that. But I guess it's a business. They're trying to see if they can get him for $6 million. I don't know. But I, I don't necessarily feel like that's probably the best way to handle it after what nine years with the team, eight years with the team. Uh, I think they could have handled it a little bit differently. How do you feel about the way the Niners handled it? Are you cool with it? Is it business? I, I try to just understand that's the business side of things. So uh, I think at this point it's not personal. They have paid him a lot of money and Jet York could tell him like we, through your career, we, we, we've given you a lot of money. So right now, you know, Hey, this is what we're willing to do. If this isn't right for you, then you could do it moving. And, and he did. So I don't yeah. even try to look at it as if it was as much disrespect. He might just because even though we're saying it's a business, he still has had a personal relationship with him, you know, for a large 
part of his life, you know, yeah. and, and, and his family. And he's a local guy, you know, from Sacramento. Uh, so I could see where he takes it a little bit more personal and feels more like it's disrespect. But I think from the 49ers standpoint, just business, yeah. brother. Yeah, and from Eric Armstead's standpoint, you got to get it while you can. I know a lot of fans were like, oh, we, you're not going to win a Super Bowl in Jacksonville. We Niners have already paid you $85 million, which they think he hasn't lived up to. So they assumed he would take a quarter of his possible pay to stay with the Niners and possibly win a Super Bowl. I don't think a lot of people would have done that, man. The Niners, I mean, you got to take that money while you can. It, it's, it's only going to be out there once. It's probably his last big contract like that i would imagine so he's got to take it man and J jacksonville they don't, they don't they don't have state taxes so he's gonna make a lot more money even if jacksonville offered him six million to match the 49 or six million that's, that's still it goes yeah. further in uh jacksonville than it does in california yeah especially the bay area it ain't even like okay he he he's in cali but he lives in stockton you know what i'm saying and even stockton you know prices get a little up there it's like, bro, he yeah. lives in the he probably lives in the bay. He might have a house in the bay and a sack. I don't know, but he yeah. likely lives in the bay in San Jose, Silicon Valley. My grandparents just sold their home a couple years ago. A normal four bedroom upstairs, downstairs, family room, living room, all that. Just but like normal four bedroom home, you know? Yeah. One million dollars. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like the yeah. San Jose is crazy, bro. San Jose is crazy. So Man, yeah. so not it don't even just take you further from the cost of living standpoint, but also the 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 financial part of it with the taxes, et cetera. It's 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 a big difference uh making the amount of money and 20 28 million guaranteed in uh Florida as opposed to anything he's gonna make in California. Yeah, man. My house where I live tripled in value since I bought it, or oh, more than tripled in value since I bought it in 2012. So California real estate prices. Are off the chain. It's like a, a what are them things? The mosquito eaters flying around here, it's tripping me out right now. Um, but yeah, no, I, I get Derek Armstead, man, totally. Uh, Dave Barclay says Ryan, I have surpassed. Ryan has surpassed all other content creators, in my opinion. Very honest and very humble. And Croc is the same. Great people here, like and subscribe. Let's get them to the top so they can cook. That is very. Uh, that's a. That's very. Uh, complimentary thing to say man uh there's a lot of great people out there and i really appreciate uh all your support dave you are the man brother all right let's move on man ba deal far away kind of expect that at this time of year it's april 1st march 31st was when this news came out you kind of expect them to be far away but what, what, what are your thoughts on on the announcement that ba and the 49ers are far away on the deal you know it sounds like normal conversation to me or normal negotiation tactics. Uh, mm -hmm. You start low here, you start high here. And you're hoping that within the conversations you can meet in the middle. What you don't want is probably the the Forrest Buckner situation where you started low here, you started high here, and then that's it. There's no more conversation. Uh, go find the trade partner. Oh, got the coach. Wow, we need to keep do, do that. First round, all right. And then he's gone, right? You don't want that situation. You want it to be more so Debo Samuel, even though it's not. As ideal, Debo, uh, uh, Nick Bosa, you know, you want your guys around, you know, the whole offseason. You don't want guys removing all 49ers stuff from their Instagram pages and all that. But I'd rather deal with that and a deal get done, uh, you know, when it's right when the season is about to start, as opposed to what they did with Buckner. So I think this is just normal negotiation tactics. Yeah, man, I think so too. You know, with BA, man, like, he deserves to be paid. Like the, the thing is with the here, here's how I feel about B. I've been saying it for a long time that he's not the kind of player you trade. He has everything going for him, right? He he works hard in practice. He shows up to training camp in phenomenal shape. He's the best player in training camp most of the time. He runs good routes. He has good hands. He's athletic. Like he blocks well. He literally does everything you want. That being said. I would trade any player for the right price, but my price for BA is very high. Like I need top 16 pick and maybe a second next year. Something like that is what I would need for to, to want to move on from BA. But there are a lot of people and a lot of opinions and it, they're valid. They kind of say the wide receivers are like the new running backs where you can replace them pretty easily through the draft. What are your thoughts on 
on trading BA? What's your price for BA? Uh, and do you think he'll be back? Look, man, I think eventually everybody has a price, you know? Um, and I think there are some things where you can kind of make it worth the 49ers. Is he a player I would trade? At? Okay, I got to look at this from two different perspectives. Yeah. If you're Eric Crocker and, and you want this legit receiver that you want to feature in your offense, would you trade Brandon Ayuk? Absolutely not. If you're the 49ers and you don't feature him in your offense, obviously – he is able to be productive in his offense, but with far less targets than the other most productive receivers in the league. So there's, you know, they run their offense and within their offense, he's able to get off. Awesome. Right. But I could see a scenario where the 49ers are saying, you know, we, we don't feature him the way that we would have to value him if we pay him a certain way. And if that's their thought process, I could see them, potentially moving off. Now I'm saying, I think he exemplifies everything they want from their receivers, right? He's blocking. He's a dog. He gets it. He's learned. He's had to get in the doghouse and get out of the doghouse, right? Um, you know, he continues to continue on his upward trajectory just with his career. But even then, when I watched the Super Bowl, what did the 49ers do to say, you know what, we're going to feature, like, man, we're at the Super Bowl. This is a big moment. Let's feature Brandon Ayuk so we can win this game. Absolutely nothing. Oh, we're just going to leave him stationary on the outside like a normal ex. Maybe he's in a tight split, but even then, versus man, we're just going to leave him there. Where, where, where is the usage like some of the other guys? Where's the, okay, we're going to motion him across the formation to a tight split, get him a free release, clear it out, come underneath, boom, right? Where's the uh, set pick plays for him when you know Sneed or whatever is having a really good game. He's on He's on right now. How are we going to work to free free up Brandon Ayuk? They never did that. So it's, oh, well, let's just figure out more ways to get the ball to Christian McCaffrey. Let's figure out more ways to get the ball to Debo Samuel, who had 13 targets or 11 targets, whatever it was. All right? So for me, it just continues to show that they love Brandon Ayuk. And within the structure of the offense, how Kyle Shanahan sees fit, he's able to be very productive, as we saw last year. But he's not featured in the offense. So in my opinion, I, I feel like if you're not going to feature him, he is a guy that you maybe feel is a little bit more replaceable than even what his numbers would say. Now I ain't saying you can replace him and get those same numbers, but I think in the sense of his importance to the offense, Kyle Shanahan probably feels like he can replace that. So from the 49ers, I could see a scenario where they potentially are like, you know what? Oh, you're going to give us the first form. Okay. You know, we'll move off of that. How much does that come into <clears throat> excuse me? How much does that come into play where you were talking about because you know they pay you this much, then they need to like does Kyle Shannon like really think about that part of it? Like if this guy's getting paid more, he we need to be featuring him more. Does that really happen, or do they just you know game plan the best game plan? Or do they actually consider that? Like is Debo featured more in this offense than he would be if he wasn't paid the way he is? No, nah, because I think Debo is featured in this offense this way even when he wasn't paid, right? Like just how do we get the ball in his hands? Remember going back to the first Super Bowl, you know, I felt like if they kept going to Debo, maybe they would they would have won and, and he would have been the Super Bowl MVP. But you just saw different ways of them working to get the ball in his hands. Oh, let's put him in the slot. Let's have him run this. Let's do this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, end the round to him, right? Like they did do more even though he wasn't a big pay guy yet. You know, he, he was a rookie. So – I think Kyle Shanahan sees the offense being run a certain way. And the guys that can help him really take that over the top, he's going to utilize them as much as he can. And he's going to value those guys a lot. And Brandon Ayuk, while again, I think he values everything that Brandon Ayuk brings. I don't know if he values Ayuk, even though we look at the numbers, the yard, or what. I don't know if he values him more in the offense than he does CMC, Debo Seven, or even George Kittle. And, mm -hmm. and you know, George Kittle, get 1,000-yard pass catcher last year, but also how much he's utilized in the in the blocking game, right? I think Kyle Shanahan really values him. So out of those four, four guys, if Kyle Shanahan, you told him, and hey, you got to trade one of these guys today, I would say Ayuk might be the odd man out in that mm -hmm. scenario. Is that how you feel when you look at <clears throat> when you look at CMC, George Kittle, Debo Samuel, and Brandon Ayuk? Is that how you feel if you're if you're the offensive coordinator or the head coach for the 49ers? 
Where do you see Brandon Ayuk ranked amongst those guys, in your opinion? Yeah, fourth. Fourth. And I know so people aren't going to – they're, they're going to look at numbers. But, again, <clears throat> we have to look at their usage and how they're used. And in the way that Ayuk is used, it is not the same – as the other guys, we can, we can look at targets and it's like, oh, he had more targets than these guys. But just the way that they use George Kittle, whether he's pass catching, whether he's blocking, whether he's going in, then I gave him end rounds, right? The way they use CMC, the way that they use CMC to be a decoy to get the ball in the hands of Debo Samuel. And then his Ayuk is like, all right, you're going to get everything else. You know, maybe you're our best, like pure pass catcher out in space, but you'll, you'll get kind of the leftovers even though on paper it might look like, oh, man, look at all this volume. Hell no, nah, man. He had three catches in each of the playoff games. Like, well, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was, and one of them, uh, Debo missed a lot of the game with the injury. I, I feel like B.A. is underused, though, man. Like, I feel like <clears> – <throat> I understand. This team is so talented. They got so many weapons. I get it. It's hard to get them all looks. And maybe it's a game-by-game -game basis. But to me, when I watch the 49ers – Debo's great with the ball in his hands, but as a receiver, man, B.A. to me is just so much better. Like, he's got better hands. He runs better routes. He can get open against press man better than Debo. I feel like I would probably – I'd be more – I mean, I'd be more willing to trade Debo and, and keep B.A. and feature B.A. more than Debo. I feel like CMC kind of took a lot of the necessity of Debo Samuel off the 49ers when he joined – the team now Debo will run through you seems he's not necessarily that guy um but I don't know man I kind of feel like BA should be featured more than than Debo if I'm the Niners I'm keeping BA and I'm rolling with Debo this year but after this year I'm probably moving on from Debo to be honest how do you feel about that I I I, I could see that happening right you can get through this whatever rough patch they got going on right now my co-host on Locked On 49ers, Brian Peacock, he's talked about it a lot, really from the jump, when we kind of saw how this was going to start playing out. I don't think the 49ers expected Debo Samuel to have the great year that he had in that 1,400-yard season. Remember, they drafted Brandon Knight first round, the year after drafting Debo Samuel second round. So uh, how much did they see Debo developing into the playmaker that he is today? Now, in the sense of how much they value him, uh, I think they value him – they might look at him as, all right, Ayuk is a better separator. Ayuk is a better route runner or pure receiver, as some people say. But Debo is, and they might say this, the better football player where, you know, just, just get the ball in his hands and he's going to make yeah. magic happen. And we've seen that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We've seen that. Uh, you know, I, I remember he was getting trolled by Eagle fans heading into that game. He's like, okay, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll watch this. And he went on a tear, right? Scored three touchdowns in that game, scored like another two touchdowns the next game, another two touchdowns after that. And he's like, yeah, I, you know, I could do this whenever I feel like it. So they might view him as a better football player, even though maybe they look at Ayuk as the better pure receiver. Yeah, I mean, Debo, when, when Debo gets going, when Debo has a game, it's like it's the one of the most exciting things to watch on this team. When when Debo has himself a game and he's full Debo mode, there's not much more exciting when, when it comes to watching the 49ers and watching Debo just go off. Um, so I understand that, man, and I can relate to that. Uh, we'll see, man. I think BA they'll probably work something out, just like they've done with Debo and Kittle and Bosa. And it just takes a while. So you're gonna hear a lot of stuff from now till then that they're far away on a deal, etc but I think they'll end up working it out. Is that your opinion too? Or do you, I think we talked and you said you might, you think they might uh, exercise their, what, fifth year option on him. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of put up 49 fans. A lot of times think that like some things just can't happen. Oh, that would never do. Uh, Brandon Ayuk will never get traded. And I'm like, look, everything is on the table again for the right price. If right. I, I like to put it in percentages. So you kind of have a understanding of what I think is most likely to happen. And I would say uh, I give it uh, a 80, uh, we'll say 70% chance that Ayuk plays on fifth year option. Now, maybe so that's talk, a little high. Let's talk about that. I want to, because I, I, we talked about that. You told me about that, and I tweeted something out, and it was controversial. A lot of people were like, 
he won't play on a fifth year option. He's not going to play. But like, can you break down like what are his choices in that situation? If the 49ers say, "Hey, we're going to just exercise your fifth year option," what do you? What are his choices? What do you think he does? He could hold out up until the season starts without getting fined. Yeah. So that was kind of the whole situation with um, Nick Bosa as well, right? With, with his resigning, where uh, typically, yeah. uh, you know, a normal player. You hold out, you are getting fined. I mean, mm. you're getting fined a, a lot of money too, at least for normal people like us. Um, and then, but with guys on their fifth year option, they can hold out and they don't have those penalties until the actual game start. So yeah. I could see a scenario where he does hold out, you yeah. know, um, and it will be understood from his players. It will be, uh, I mean, his teammates, it will be understood from his coaches, Kyle Shanahan. Remember, Kyle Shanahan isn't the guy that says, you know, all right, we're going to give you this mon- amount of money for this. That's Parag Marate. Yeah. Right? Like, that's yeah. Jay York. They're kind of, you know, Kyle can say, hey, hey, I want you guys to prioritize them this way. But if the, you know, Parag- Marate is the guy, Parag, he's the guy who pulls the strings on the actual contract. So, you know, everybody will understand the business side of things, really for both sides. But yeah. it, it's got to make sense. So, again, fifth-year option, I think if they just held true to that, yeah, week one, I think you'd see him out there playing on his fifth year option. Yeah. Cause, but cause would there be a holdout in the process? Yeah. Bye. So I give him, even with that, and maybe he's a guy that says, you know what? Just get the thing done. I'm going to show up. Uh, he may not show up to OTAs, but training camp, I'm going to show up. But get the thing done, agent 49ers. Get it done. He could say that. But I give it a, again, 70% chance he plays on fifth year option. I give it a 20% chance they, they, they are able to uh, sign them to a new deal. You know, if it makes sense for them and they're able to extend them and that maybe lowers his cap this year, et cetera, I give it like a 20% chance, maybe a little bit higher than that. I give it a 10% chance he's traded. So yeah. that's not to say that he will get traded, but it's clearly something I feel like that can happen. And now yeah. that is a 10% chance. That's a small chance, in my opinion, uh, out of some things that are very realistic. But it is a possibility. Correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe some people in the chat know more. Maybe you know more, E, but I believe if he was to sit out, let's say he sat out all year long, that, that his, he's still under contract for the following year because he didn't accrue the whole year, I believe. That con- that year, that contract that was due this year just kicks kicked down to the next year. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. So I don't think Brendan Ayuk has a lot of leverage in this scenario. So it, he's probably going to end up taking a contract – in my opinion, probably not as great as he thought he was going to get or hoped he was going to get, but he's going to take it because he really doesn't have many options. Uh, you know, they could just, like you said, put him on a fifth year option and he's got to play. Uh, so I think I think they work something out and it's probably not as great as he had hoped because of the leverage they have. And then here's the other thing. If if he was to hold out, I mean, now it's a contract year. Right. And then I believe they can even franchise tag him after him. that if they want it. You know, which would be funky. Probably it might makes a lot of sense from a business standpoint for the Niners, honestly. Um, but it would make the it would make the situation a little funky, I think. Yeah. So and, and that's the business side of things, but eventually they end up trading that guy. You know, it was yeah. like we really can't, you know, we couldn't get anything done before the fifth year option. He played on the fifth year option. We'll bring him back. We will tag him in hopes to get something done. And I think at that point, if you can't, then you the, that trade percentage I said is ten percent turns into like ninety percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you if you fifth year option a guy, then franchise tag a guy, that relationship has soured at that point, and you're gonna move on. I, I would imagine at some point. All right, um, I do want to say this because I see in the chat it was like, oh, he has no leverage. I, I, I I'm not gonna say that he has no leverage in the situation. Yeah. Um, I think everybody has their negotiation tactics. I do expect him to be playing in a 49ers uniform this year. So yeah. if you mean by no leverage, uh, you know, he will eventually be on the field, then I'd say, okay, I agree with you on that. But just in the sense of the contract negotiations and how they go, you know, nobody wants a disgruntled player around. You know, nobody yeah. wants a guy around that's, you know, he hasn't been, as he sees it, taken care of. And, you know, you, you know, you guys don't, they don't want that around. So there is leverage in that. Like you, yeah. you don't want that. You know, I just talked about the locker room earlier. If you guys were here, and I talked about how like the locker room, everybody they get it. You know, what I'm saying that it's cool. When I was there, 
uh, with the Jets during that time, you know, Darrell Revis was holding out. Nobody in the locker room was tripping. Like, I yeah. never even heard anybody really talk about it. Like, that's Revis's business. So right. he wasn't there. I didn't get a whole lot of time with Revis. You know, I, I, I got there. I showed up, you know, the start of uh, veteran OTAs. Uh, you know, he's holding out. He's holding out. Eventually, he comes back for a week or two, and then he was traded to Tampa Bay Buccaneers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but even then, it, there was no, like, oh, man, Revis tripping, man, he this and that. Like, yeah, the players like, understand because yeah, they understand. would do the same thing. But yeah. you don't want that guy around that is disgruntled. I could see how that could affect a locker room, a, a yeah. guy that's not happy in the situation, which, again, I didn't see that. And even guys like – I remember Antonio Camardi. When the when the Jets drafted D Milliner, Antonio Camardi, who had like an extra, another year on his contract, he was like, "Oh yeah, I'm going after this year." Like he, he just know the business side of things. He's like, "Yeah, they're not, not they're not gonna keep paying." And and guess what? Cromarty was gone after that year, but he just knew, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it wasn't even no. Uh, he still went about, you know, at least the time I was there, about everything from a, you know, hey man, it's business. And he took care of business, and he did what he had to do, prepared his body. Uh, you know, the, the, the right way. And then when the season was over. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right. We, we say it a lot, but it is, it, it's a business. Uh, speaking of business, man, I expected Demo, Diamador Lenore and Traverius Ward, one or both of them to be um, extended or something. They're both free agents after this coming season, which is kind of alarming for me. If nothing gets done, hopefully something still gets done. You know, nobody's talking about it. Press isn't talking about it. Niners aren't releasing any statements about it. You haven't heard Demo or Ward say anything about it. But both of them are free agents after this season, which is a little concerning for me because both of those dudes are dogs. Those are our one and two corners. What does this mean to you, man? Are you surprised they, that, that they're still going to be free agents at this point? Uh, not surprised at all with Traverius Ward, but I am surprised with Diama Lenore. I think this was a, a great opportunity for the 49ers to – you know, extend him on a more of a friendly deal, right? When mm -hmm. I say friendly, like, obviously, like, you know, he'd be taken care of, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't have had to be, especially with him spending so much time in the nickel last year, it wouldn't have to be a big contract. Now, we talk about nothing being done. Maybe Diamador Lenore doesn't want something done. Maybe they did bring an offer to him and his agent. Uh, right maybe one to pay him as a nickel. You know, I've heard things, and I don't know, I'd have to ask him, but that he'd prefer to play outside. That's mm -hmm. understandable because outside corners get paid more than nickels do. And maybe the 49ers coming off of a season where he spent a lot of his time at nickel, we're like, oh, we'll pay you like a solid nickel. And, hey, you've only really done this for one year playing at this level, so we'll give you this three years, you know, $21 million. And he's like, hell no. Nah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't taking that. And I said, like, all right, you, well, maybe you'll just end up being a free agent and on the market he make more money. Uh, now, again, I, I don't know. That's just how I could see – things maybe going with him. But as far as Shavari's Ward, uh, I would wait to see how this season goes. You know, do you draft a, a young corner uh, that you really like? Do you, um, you know, maybe develop him? Maybe do you see a scenario where it's Demo, uh, you know, a rookie, and heck, Isaac Edom, you know what I'm saying, uh, you know, at the corner's position. So, I, I could see them maybe doing away with Shavari's Ward at the end of the year. Yeah, and this makes me kind of feel like because this is the case that they are going to be both free agents after this season that it, when this draft comes, I would imagine they pick a corner pretty early, some, somewhere in the top four or five rounds, I would I would assume, uh, unless they just got plans for free agency next year. I'm not sure, but it, it is surprising that they didn't work nothing out with either one. Ward, I get you. He's a little he's a little older. I mean, he, he played great last year, but he's, what, 29? He'll be like 30, I think. Um, I believe, and then Demo's a lot younger, so I agree, man. I, I expected them, and they could have saved like I think two million, one point eight million, if they figure something out with Yamato Lenore. Um, so it's surprising that it hasn't happened, but maybe you're right. Maybe Demo's betting on himself. Seems like it'd be so hard, man, from a business standpoint. Seems like it would be really hard if somebody's offering you millions of dollars to be like, Nah, I'm good. I'm gonna bet on myself and make even more. Uh, by doing that, it's that would be hard. For are, me. are you talking about with Diamondo Lenore? Yeah, like if they're offering. Have you me, heard like, the way he? Have you heard the way he talks? A little bit, yeah. Why? Why? What, what makes you say that? 
I, I don't think there's anybody that believes in themselves more than Diamond Dolan. Yeah. So if yeah. there's anybody that's yeah. willing to test the waters and see how this season goes and all that, it's yeah. Demo. <laughs> Man, it's it'd be Demo. so hard though. Like he's on his rookie contract, right? I'm 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 pretty sure he's still on his rookie contract, but someone's offering you like 22 million guaranteed or something like that. Man, that would be tough to be like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. That would be so hard for me. For me, I'd be like, yes, give me, give it a damn money. Um, but, but maybe that's what agents are for too, right? Maybe his agents in his ear, like, man, you can get a lot more. And he probably would get a lot more if he just plays, if he balls out this year, goes to free agency, he's probably going to get a lot. So it makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, Brock Purdy, man. The name of the show is 49ers Brock Purdy. This isn't talked about enough. I was chilling with my guy Melvin in the chat this weekend. My boy jumped at the Stanford track meet this past weekend. So me and Melvin rolled out and watched my son do track at Stanford. And I was just like talking to him and just thinking about it. You know, I'm actually known. A lot of people know me for because I call Brock Purdy Dink and Dunk. And they think I'm a dunk, uh, Brock hater. Really never was the case that I was a Brock hater. I just, his first year, he kind of showed me he wasn't really pushing it deep. Second year killed it deep and so i took back that whole dink and dunk shit and I, I was impressed with brock purdy when you think about brock purdy man he's really done some amazing things like just to like summarize it and a lot of us know this but to be the last pick in the nfl draft third quarterback on your team come in go on a win streak the way he did phenomenal then he gets injured ucl injury I didn't even think he was going to be ready week one. Not only was he ready week one, he was ready for training camp. He was, you know, doing good in training camp. And then he comes in and balls out, takes the team to the Super Bowl. And I don't think anyone will really be like, he's the reason we lost the Super Bowl. He played fine. Played fine in the playoffs. What he's been able to do is really remarkable when you think about it. And based on that track record, I feel like him having a whole offseason, see, this dude might ball the hell out even more this coming season. The mental side of Brock Purdy is actually really effing impressive, man. And I wanted to get your your take on that. Uh, I, I like that you talked about it. Just mental side. And I, I, just who he is, right? Um, I've talked about this before on Locked On 49ers where people were talking about his maturity. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, again, have you listened to the guy talk? Yeah. Uh, and he comes as someone that has a strong faith in the Lord. He's extremely grounded. And I think that's why he comes off a lot, just as confident, but as grounded. But his preparation, you know, he, he's married. I, I think there's a lot to that. I became the best version of myself, you know, while when I was when I got married to my wife, you know For what I'm sure. saying? And yeah, maybe too. not your one, you know, year yeah. two. But hey, I got better as the years went on <laughs> yeah. and I became a better man. Yeah. Better man, mm -hmm. better father, uh, more organized with the way I went about things. And you see him and someone who, you know, married at a young age. And I think there's just a certain level of uh preparation, focus, mindset. He clearly has a chip on his shoulder and, and has a certain level of tenacity. And there's something about him to where all his teammates, they, they follow him and they follow his lead. Uh, but because he wasn't a first round pick, a lot of times you, you think, and I'll get to this as well. Oh, uh, maybe he doesn't have the upside as some of these other guys. Hmm. Well, maybe he doesn't physically, but mentally he can have the upside of whoever is the well, mentally toughest, sharpest quarterback in the NFL. Yeah. And I would say so far what he has shown us is that, regardless of whatever limitations he may have physically. And I don't think they're like huge glaring limitations, but it was something for him to end up being the last pick in the draft. He has shown the worth all the, the strength, the fortitude to be able to push through that and overcome it. You know, I was a guy, you know, 6'2", 200 pound cornerback. I ran a four, five, five, you know, I wasn't the fastest guy. I had to kind of overcome and, at least as much as I could, not being the fastest corner, right? Like not being fast. Um, and I had to learn how to play around that. And I think with 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 Brock, he has really learned. Okay, I I, I have a I have a solid arm. I don't have a power arm, right? How do I overcome? Man, I can overcome that with uh, being pinpoint with my you know precision, my accuracy. Man, I could be better with my timing and understanding the defenses. 
uh, being able to, you know, throw with anticipation and do those things. And I could see a scenario where he continues to improve on those things. But I think because he wasn't this high draft pick, people maybe think that he's at his ceiling when in all actuality, uh, you know, I think nobody's at their ceiling in year three. I think these are guys that continue to improve and get better. So I'd expect that from him as well. Yeah, and I can see him playing. He's never had a problem with confidence, but I can see him playing even more confident now. Like this is established Brock Purdy's team, no question at all. Like you're healthy. You got a full off season as the guy. This is your team. You know the offense. I can see his confidence being greater. His his understanding of the offense being greater. His arm improving with a full off season to work at it. I can see Brock Purdy really doing good. And the reason why, like. Again, I don't think he's like the ultra physical talented quarterback, but one thing I've noticed in sports is the mental part makes a huge mental might be more important than physical. Like obviously when you're a corner like Croc here, you got to have the physical traits to play that position. You got to be fast and you got to be able to move and, and be of a certain size or whatnot. But the mental part is really what makes athletes better than others, right? There's a oh. like, you could take two guys that have identical athletic attributes, but one has the mind, and and that was that's what makes them better. They they tell you from from the jump when you get to the league. Cause again, everybody's got. I I had commented on something about the new kickoff rules, right? Mm -hmm. And I had some people, oh, special teams wasn't why you didn't make it in the NFL. You weren't good enough. Blah 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 blah. Dude, the the the, the when you get to the league, from an ability standpoint, it's very marginal. Right. It's very marginal. They tell you from the jump a couple of things. One, the game is 90% mental, 10% physical. 90% mental, 10% physical because everybody's good. Mm -hmm. And then they also tell guys like me, your way to making this team will be special teams. We do not need you to be a good cover guy at, you know, at, at this point. Well, we got Antonio Camardi. We just drafted D. Miller in the ninth overall. We got Kyle Wilson. He was a number nine, uh, first round pick. You know, we got Darren Walls, who was, you know, a terrific uh, feeling guy as well. Then you had Ellis Langster and uh, Trufant, who were both special team demons. You got to beat out those special teams demons. So it's funny because people are like, oh, you, you wouldn't have made it anyways. You weren't like, man, y'all don't know how this stuff works. But it is 90% mental, 10% physical when it comes to uh, being able to make it at the NFL level. That's why you see guys drafted, you know, it's like half the first round picks don't quite work out. It's because these guys that are 6'4", 275 pounds, running 4'6", they're not physically gifted enough? Hell yeah. no, they definitely are. Yeah, It's the mental side of it. Being able to, uh, you know, do the thing. Trey Lance, you know, he had the physical talent has mm -hmm. the physical talent mentally for whatever reason right it could be lack of experience it could be whatever he was not able to be sharp with the things that Kyle Shanahan needed him to be sharp with right and if you can't do that it's hard to play at the NFL level right these yeah. are the, you can't they're not gonna be able to execute enough mm -hmm. uh so you know that's the tough part where Brock Purdy says man hey I I can do this I can do that. And yeah. he's done nothing but that. And, and and I'd assume that he continues to get better. Now, I did have somebody in the chat. Salty Cyclist says, Big Ben makes that throw over Chris Jones barreling down on him to win the game in the Super Bowl. And I think from that standpoint, uh, those are the things that Brock, you know, maybe it's experience, right? When understanding, okay, free runner, okay, I got this. And then he makes the throw. Yeah. That needs to be made. But, yeah, I mean, there's going to be some limitations because of his physical skill set. But when, like, even you are talking about his 90% mental, he's his mentality is amazing. Like, based on everything I've seen, to be able to come in with that confidence, you got that right mind. You got to write the right mindset. To be able to process the way he does, something's really good with his mindset. So, based on his experience and what he's been able to do with the opportunities he's had. Now he's got a full off season. He's healthy. That leads me to believe he's going to take strides. Now that doesn't necessarily mean to me that his statistics are going to be better, right? Maybe he loosens up to the point where he's a little bit more 
carefree, a little bit more aggressive, and that can cause some turnovers. Maybe his efficiency goes down, but overall as a quarterback, I think he can actually be better regardless of what the statistics say. What, what kind of year do you expect from Brock Purdy? Same as last year. I mean, I don't even know how he can do too much better from an efficiency standpoint, leadership standpoint. There were some games where we needed him to play big, and he did. You know, you you, you led a team that, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, got a, a, a bye. And, you know, now it's just for him, you know, with the 49ers game, your expectations are going to be really high. It's, it's, play, it's being able to make the plays – that aren't there to be made mm -hmm. and doing that in the right moment. And you talked about him like, Oh, nobody will say Brock Purdy lost the 49ers Super Bowl. Hell no. But I will say this. I don't think Brock Purdy won the 49ers, the Super Bowl. So yeah, how, lost, how, do, how yeah. if you're Brock, how mm -hmm. do I win this game for my team? Now there's going to be people in the come. Well, what about this fumble here? What about the botch pump returning? Oh, those are all things that just shape the movie of a Super Bowl, but ultimately it's on the, in my opinion, more times than not, it's going to be on the quarterback to be able to rise above that in certain situations. And uh, I think for Brock, the, the plays that maybe weren't there, you got a free runner. How am I going to make this play? How am I going to find this guy making that play? And when he does that, that will be the difference between Brock last year and this year, man, last year, he didn't make that play. He made yeah. all these throws. He did this and this. But in this moment, man, last year he didn't make that play. Man, this year he did make that play. This year he made that throw. And that's how the 49ers win the Super Bowl. And that's what would be the difference, in my opinion. You think it can happen? Yeah, hell yeah. Because, man, because of his faith in the Lord, man, and, and who he is and how he goes uh, uh, approaches things. I definitely yeah. think he can. He's got a great mentality, man. Like, I, I made the mistake of – uh, you know, because I suffered through Jimmy Garoppolo, right? And he was the definition of dink and dunk. And it, but Jimmy, the funny thing is, it really wasn't about his arm talent. He actually has more arm talent than Brock Purdy. He could actually yeah. throw the ball downfield. It was, it was the mental part. And but I kind of mistake a hey, Jimmy's dink and dunk. I want a quarterback that can take the top off and go deep. And that's why I was excited about Trey Lance. And when I saw Brock Purdy's first year, I'm like, man, this guy's not going deep because he wasn't. His first year, he wasn't. Uh, but his second year, he developed it more and deep enough is what I mean. Like, he's not going to throw 65-yard bombs, but how often do you really need that? As long as you can throw those 35, 40-yard ones, that's what you really need. And and he's able to do that. And he did do that this year uh, when the opportunity presented itself. So that's what really turned me around on Brock Purdy. And then, you know, just this past weekend, thinking about his mindset and what he's been able to accomplish, it actually gives me a lot of confidence. Uh, uh, real quick. Uh, Melvin in chat says, so do other quarterbacks not believe in the Lord? No, they definitely do. I'm just telling you that's why Brock Purdy, like in a sense of being able to overcome certain things, it's I think he's very well grounded with the Lord, and he has everything else to go with that, right? Because, I mean, shoot, you know, there's a lot of believers in, in, in God. You know what I'm saying? But with, with Brock, you could see, like, man, he truly believes in this, and he goes about things a certain way. And I got all these experiences from college. I got this, and I got that, and I'm going to prepare a certain way. So to me, it's like there's nothing that this guy can't do from a mental standpoint. And he's shown us it. But I can only see him because of how grounded he is. We've seen a lot of guys have a good year. Maybe they're not as grounded with every, whatever parts in their life. You, talk, you and I talked about 75 hard. And not being able to finish it. Mm. It's tough, right? Yeah. Like it's a certain mindset that you and anybody can do it. Everybody here has the opportunity to do that and finish it. But are you going to do it? And there's yeah. a lot of guys that can, you know, give you a year. We'll say that's a, 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 a year is we'll say that's 15 days of 75 hard. Mm -hmm. Can you do two years of it, right? 30, 30 days. Can you do three years if you know, finish it right? Like, can you can you have that mental <laughs> that mental yeah. uh, uh, that mentality to be able to do it all the way through and continue to do it? And we've seen a lot of players come in and have a great all men's had do had a great year. Damn, what happened to him? What happened to him? Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 I, and I, I think what Melvin's point is probably it doesn't require that you be religious in order to do that because there's guys. 100% like, not. Yeah, 100%. I, I think that's whatever you what believe in. Yeah. 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 All right, man. Uh, last question. Round one prediction. Do you have one for me, man? How's a, for, how's round one going to go? Man, that's a great question. Uh, with, with the 49ers right now, I think they've done a really good job of constructing a roster right now that allows them to truly take the highest player on their board. Now, I know that's a cop-out answer a little bit, but who who is that? What What is it? I think it could be kind of anything. If I had to lean one direction right now, um, I like that defensive lineman out of Missouri. Uh, who is it? I'm talking about uh... – can't think of his name. Me and Peacock, we've watched so many prospects. The, the, the defensive tackle? He's a D, he's a DN, but he's a big, he's a tall dude. He looks like longer and lengthier, boss. But um, but he no uh diddy. no diddy. He's no diddy. But man, you yeah. watch him take on doubles, you know, power through that, uh, set the edge in the run game, give you a little off the edge in the pass game, but um I really like him. He might be my draft crush right now. Just, you know, watching and trying to think of how the 49ers, you know, can replace what they gave you with Eric Armstead and find that guy. You know, one thing the 49ers have been really good with is uh, having that edge setter guy like the uh, Aminahu, right, mm -hmm. who can play outside, slide inside, you know, in those situations. Okay, now we can bring Leonard Floyd off the edge. That kid from Missouri, man. You're talking I, about I Darius really like Robinson? Is that your Yes, about? Robinson. Robinson. Yeah, okay. so there's two Robinsons. Chop Robinson, Darius Robinson. I'm high yeah. on Darius Robinson. I, I like what he could bring to the 49ers. I got to check him out, man. To be honest, I haven't looked at him very much, but now I'm intrigued. Uh, so I'm going to go Strong, check him out. Strong, just, mm, move guy. I mean, when they, oh, they, you know, when they attack him, he he anchors down versus the run. He's not getting blown back, but he's like 6'5", 285, 80, 287. But when you look at him, he looks like a, a longer, leaner guy uh, just mm -hmm. with how he built. But long arms and, I mean, boom, he's taking on those. He's creating piles. He's bull rushing guys with the one-hand stab. You know, he's – he you know, the, him versus run is what really got me excited. And I think that's the first time I've ever gotten excited about a defensive end because of how well he defends the run. So I, I like well, him. You know, if you're excited, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch definitely are. I, I, you know, I agree, man. I think that's the way they go. They're definitely going best player available. So for all of us, like I want an offensive, I want a right tackle so damn bad. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to be the best player available. And I don't think the 49ers are going to just commit to that position. So I, I expect them to get the best player available, whether it could be a corner, defense alignment, O lineman, it could be a wide receiver. Uh, who knows what it's going to be, man? Yeah. I agree with you. Um, I want to get your take real quick on this before we get out of here. What do you think of the two? There's two rules, right? There's the kickoff rule. There's a hip drop tackle. Thanks to Anthony for the $2 super chat who brought this up because I wasn't even thinking about this. But I do want to get your take as somebody who played the game at a high level. What do you think of the hip drop tackle ban? And then could you also talk about the kickoff? Hip drop, man, I think it's ridiculous. Um, you know, You know, until you have to really tackle these dudes, see how big they are. Um, you know, my mindset and what I tell my players, I do, I don't, I don't care if you're the big hitter, right? I coach DBs at Edison high school in Stockton, not Fresno, Stockton, but, um, Hey man, I don't care if you're a big hitter, you're blowing guys up, just get the guy to the ground. And at the NFL level, guys are bigger and faster. So a guy like me, you know, I was a big corner at six two, two hundred pounds, man, you got to. You know, a 5'9", 220-pound running back running at you or a 6'5", 255-pound tight end coming at you, you're think I just got to get them to the ground. So yeah. I don't think you're thinking, oh, let me do this hip drop tackle and tear a guy's ankle up. Yeah. You're just like, okay, how can I, you know, wrap them up and, and drop my weight to bring them down to the ground? So right. I think it's just, you know, another thing that makes it a little bit tougher for guys uh, – you know, if you're keeping the game safe, all right, I, I get it, but it's just tough on it's tougher on the, especially the back end guys for sure. And even yeah, some linebackers because they're getting a little bit smaller now, too. I don't see how in the in the heat of the moment you're like think you can think about how you're gonna tackle a dude. Like you just tackle them, right? And like it, it just general, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh 
I can't think of the damn word. You know, the objects, objects in motion, stay in motion. What, what, is that? what am I, what am I trying to think of? Uh, I don't know. I can't think of it. But the point is, it, it, it's very. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Like if you're tackling guy from the side or the back who's running this same direction as you. There's the only way to get him down is to go backwards. I mean, what are you going to do? Fall forward on him, give him like seven extra yards? It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I think it's going to be tough, man. I think a lot of guys are going to get fined because it's really hard to alter that, really. You know? Yeah. And that kickoff, I actually like that. I know a lot of people complain about it. But again, I'm I'm thinking about the guys yeah. like me. So this might be a little bias going on. But yeah. the guys like me who, you know, had to drop back, get to a spot. And and you got Jason Pierre Paul, you know, <laughs> running full speed from 40 yards away. And it's like, okay, I gotta get in front of this guy and I gotta block him. And you know, I know I've gotten depleted many times. I know a lot of guys can't. Maybe that's just football and the physicality is like crock, you just can't do it. But um, I just know how like just the collisions that happen right there. And um, I'm all for collisions, but come on, man. Six, six, five, 260 pound dude getting a 40 yard head start sprint at at me like that. I think that's a little ridiculous. Figure it out, maybe yeah. put bigger guys back there. But um, you know, I I kind of like the thought of bringing the kick return back. You know, and now you got guys they're about five yards apart from each other. You, they, you know, you still block, you still do, do all those things, but the collisions aren't as crazy. And then as a, a kicker, you get more incentive in in the sense of kicking it to the between the 10 and the goal line, because if you kick it out the end zone, the offense now gets the ball at the 30. So I, yeah. I think that's going to actually bring kick return back because you don't want them to start at the 30. So let's kick it in between the, you know, the five, the, the 10 and the goal line and make these guys return. Let's get down there, make some tackles. And um, I think it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I can't think of the name of this. I was trying to say, but yeah, man, I, I agree with you. Kickoff return. So look, uh, this is bugging me, Croc. I'm sorry. It's not making sense to people watching, but goes emotions. Still, what? So, like, there's math, there's science, there's chemistry, there's algebra, and there's this that describes this phrase. I'm talking about. You guys, help me out, chat. You're usually smarter, smarter than me, so you can figure it out. But yeah, I, I think 25% of the time they returned kicks last year. It was annoying. It made the game boring, right? They're, they're taking touchbacks 75% of the time. There we go, Melvin. I appreciate you. Physics. That's what I was trying to say. The physics of it with the hip drop tackles. Thank you, guys. See? See, I knew you guys would come through. Um, but, yeah, no. It's going to create more kickoffs. And is different, which to me is going to make the game more exciting because there's a little change in the game now. and We get to watch it, and I'm, I'm enjoying that, man. So, yeah, I'm all for the kickoff return thing, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, man. I appreciate you. What's your schedule like on, on your show and Locked On 49ers? What do you got going on? Uh, this has been the only show I actually stream to my channel right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Once I get to this new house, you, I coming. should be like picking things back up. And, and it's coming, man. Or as soon as I get off this, I got to go to the IRS, get some things situated with my uh, my taxes. But uh, close, man. My wife and I were hoping for a pre-approval today. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But, P, uh, you know, Peacock and I, we're on five days a week. Uh, locked on 49ers and uh man we love and appreciate everybody everybody sees me in the top four of that uh what, what the gold rush uh podcast the network is doing yeah uh, with the voting but for me that's me and peacock you know what i'm saying uh that that's me and peacock so i'm representing all the locked on uh right there so yeah man y'all go vote yeah make sure you guys go vote for my guy crocker crocker i love i love doing these shows every week you offer a unique perspective uh that not a lot of these people that talk about the Niners have. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you for being here. And then we'll link up next Monday, same time, same place. Yes, sir. All right, y'all. I'll be on with Grant about 11 a.m. I'll be back Wednesday with the coach and then Friday special guest. Thank you, guys. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, all that good stuff. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching the Ryan G. Hensley Show. Your support is greatly appreciated. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel. The Ryan G. Hensley Show is brought to you by Hensley Real Estate and Mortgage. I've been operating my real estate business in the state of California since 2009, and I would love to help your family. We are also sponsored by Hensley Solar. I can put solar on your house in up to 38 states. Underdog Fantasy is a sponsor of the channel. Please check out the details in the description.
see how you can join Underdog Fantasy and get $100 matched in your initial deposit. And finally, I want to give a shout out to my sponsor, Blue Water Credit. They are the best credit repair company I've ever dealt with. If you want to fix your credit, reach out to Blue Water Credit. Details in the description for all of my sponsors. Again, thanks so much for watching. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you're not. 